They say that grandchildren are the dessert of life, and this is one of my desserts. This is my granddaughter Alexis. She is 11 years old. Look at those outstretched arms of hers. They measure just a little over 5 feet, 62 inches from fingertip to fingertip. Now imagine that's 5 billion years, roughly the age of the solar system. The solar system begins here, right at the tip of her middle finger. About 5 billion years ago, there was a molecular cloud about 60 light years in diameter just hanging out in space. It was 90% hydrogen, 8% helium, and 2% dust. That dust was the ash of millions of previous supernova and was composed of every naturally occurring element including oxygen, nitrogen, iron, silicon, gold, uranium, and all the others. Right here at inch 6, half a billion years later, a shock wave from yet another supernova slams into this cloud and causes it to fragment into thousands of little cloudlets, each a few light days in diameter. Some of these cloudlets are pushed past a critical density and begin to collapse into stars, and an open star cluster begins to form. One of the collapsing cloudlets in that cluster will become our sun. It takes a hundred thousand years, about the width of a hair on this scale, for the collapse to complete. During this time, the cloudlet spins faster and faster as it shrinks. The spinning flattens it. The dust particles in that disk collide and stick at first by electrostatic and chemical attraction and later by gravity. Rocks form, then bigger rocks, then planetesimals miles in diameter. These collide with ever more force, forming the planets in our system. Meanwhile, the sun is starting to shine. Not by nuclear fusion, not yet, but simply by the energy of its own gravitational collapse. But that's a lot of energy, and so the young sun is very hot and has a ferocious solar wind. That wind rapidly pushes all the dust out of the system, leaving the newly formed planets to fend for themselves. And fend they do. For a hundred million years, just over an inch on this scale, the remaining planetesimals continue to bombard the newly formed planets, keeping those planets growing and molten. Halfway through this process, the nuclear furnace of the core of the Sun turns on, and it graduates to a true main sequence star. Sometime during this period, a planetesimal the size of Mars smashes into the young Earth, melting it and splashing material into a ring. That ring forms into our moon. Then things settle down. The collisions end, the planets cool, and pretty much nothing else happens. But disaster is only six more inches away, half a billion years. You see, the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, have been in a dance with each other. Jupiter moves inwards towards the Sun, but is stopped when it reaches a two-to-one resonance with Saturn. That resonance drives Neptune far out into the vast reservoir of asteroids, causing them to plunge inwards, pummeling the interplanets and our Moon once again. And so, the Earth's Hadean Eon, the first foot on this scale, the first billion years of our solar system, ends with the late heavy bombardment. But there's a silver lining. That late bombardment seems to have included a lot of ice, and so our oceans fill. As that bombardment ends at inch 15, 3.8 billion years ago, the first chemical evidence of life appears, oxygen. For we find the first deposits of banded iron on old seafloors 3.8 billion years ago. We believe this formed as photosynthetic cyanobacteria dumped oxygen into the atmosphere, causing the iron dissolved in the oceans to rust and fall to the bottom. Just past inch 18, 300 million years later, we see the first fossils of that cyanobacteria. Over the next 10 inches, or 800 million years, nothing much else happens other than the accumulation of more and more banded iron deposits on the sea floor. So long as the oxygen is getting grabbed by the iron in the oceans, it can't build up in the atmosphere. So the oceans simply continue to rust. Then, just past 28 inches, 2.7 billion years ago, all hell breaks loose in a massive global eruption. Not the first, not the last, but a big one nonetheless. 
Fortunately, life had a strong hold in the oceans, and not even a global volcanic catastrophe could stop it. Now we pass the halfway point in the Earth's history and come to inch 34. It has taken over a billion and a half years, but the oxygen produced by the cyanobacteria has finally rusted all the iron in the oceans. The level of oxygen in the atmosphere has risen to 18%. 100 million years later, at inch 36, we see the first hints of eukaryotes, cells with nuclei, and the evolution of complex life forms takes a tiny step forward. At inch 37, the first mountains begin to form, and then a huge 10-kilometer asteroid plows into the planet, leaving a 300-kilometer crater. At inch 40, another big meteor smashes into what will become Canada, leaving a 250-kilometer crater. But at inch 43, 1.5 billion years ago, modern complex eukaryotes show up. Life is on the verge of a revolution. And that revolution comes 300 million years later, when sex is invented. Now we change our perspective and look at the final 12 inches, leaving the previous 50 inches and 4 billion years in the past. At inch 52, the Earth freezes solid. Ice covers the oceans to a depth of a mile or more. This likely happened several times, possibly due to the arrangement of the continents. But eventually this period passes and the Earth warms up again. An inch later, we see protozoans and worms. Two inches further on, the first true arthropods, fungi, mollusks, sponges, and corals form, and creatures with bilateral symmetry begin to appear. Two tenths of an inch later, 542 million years ago, with only 6.7 inches left in our timeline, the diversity of life explodes into the oceans. Nearly all current phyla, including chordates such as squid and vertebrates such as fish, appear. Another two-tenths of an inch later, animals walk on land. Things are going to move very fast now, so we need to switch from inches to millimeters. The first breath of air is breathed 132 millimeters from the end. Six millimeters later, insects appear. Another 27 millimeters, and reptiles are present. And then, with only 78 millimeters to go, the greatest extinction we know of took place, the Great Dying. 95% of everything dies. We speculate about volcanism and meteors, but we aren't sure of the cause. But life finds a way, because 9 millimeters later the dinosaurs appear, and mammals show up 3 millimeters later. We are now 68 millimeters from the end. That's about the length of her middle finger, so let's zoom in again. Birds appear with only 49 millimeters to go. Eight millimeters later, the Atlantic Ocean begins to form. Bees evolve nine millimeters after that. Antarctica splits from Australia six millimeters later. And the Tyrannosaurus Rex appears four millimeters after that. We've got 21 and a half millimeters left to go. A single millimeter later, 65 million years ago, all the dinosaurs are obliterated in a single stroke. A huge meteor smashes into Central America, wiping out the vast majority of life on the planet. But life is tenacious, and primates evolve within 2.5 millimeters, or half a million years. And now, with only 17 millimeters to go, Africa collides with Europe, and India smashes into Asia, raising the Himalayas. Five millimeters later, cats appear. Then after three millimeters more, there are deer. Hominids appear two millimeters after that, horses two and a half millimeters later, and the human chimpanzee split just a single millimeter after that. There are just under 1.9 millimeters and six million years to go. The woolly mammoth appears within the next half millimeter. Then an early ancestor of ours, the Australopithecus, a tenth of a millimeter later. The Isthmus of Panama closes with less than a millimeter to go, and the world enters the current ice age just a tenth of a millimeter later. With just half a millimeter to go, Homo erectus uses fire. Three tenths of a millimeter after that, Yellowstone blows up, and Homo erectus moves to Europe. We are now two tenths of a millimeter and 500,000 years from the present. Time to switch to microns. With 110 microns to go, Neanderthals evolve. 16 microns later, wolves appear. 
30 microns later, modern men are in Africa. We've got 200,000 years to go. 50,000 years ago and 16 microns later, mitochondrial Eve, the mother of every human alive, is born in Africa. 11 microns later, the most recent glaciation of the current ice age begins. Within 8 microns, the Y chromosome Adam, the father of every man alive, is born in Africa. With only 75,000 years and 24 microns to go, the super eruption of Mount Toba darkens the skies and worsens the ice age. Humans barely survive, perhaps just a few hundred. But those who do leave Africa five microns later and create cave paintings in France six microns after that. Six microns later, with just 30,000 years and nine microns to go, dogs evolve and Neanderthals go extinct. A micron later, the diversity and quality of human-made tools and clothing explodes, and humans migrate into North America. A micron later, the first computer, a tally stick, is used. Four microns before the present, the ice recedes. Jericho is founded a micron later. The next to last micron sees copper smelted, mummies in Egypt, the wheel, the extinction of the mastodon, the Sumerians, writing, and the beginning of recorded human history. A young girl, her arms outstretched as if to embrace the world, and yet everyone she ever knew, loved, or even heard about lived here in the last two millionths of a meter at the tip of her left fingernail. To her and to us, the dinosaurs lived at a time too remote to imagine, and yet in reality they lived here between the second and third knuckles of her finger. And so animals and plants are new things on the earth. Their time has just started, their era just begun, but not so for life in general, for life is old beyond understanding and fills almost her entire embrace. <laughs>